my dear brothers and sisters. The bishop brought together all of the different religious orders and consecrated religious to gather in the cathedral for evening prayer. While they were praying, a fuse blew and all the lights went out. The Benedictines continued praying from memory without skipping a beat. <laughs> the Jesuits began to discuss whether the blown fuse meant they were dispensed from the obligation <laughs> to pray evening prayer. The Franciscan friars and sisters composed a song of praise for God's gift of brother darkness. <laughs> the IHMs revisited their ongoing debate on light as a significant transmission of divine knowledge. The Carmelites fell into silence and slow breathing. The Daughters of Charity were preparing a plan to gather blankets for everyone because the heat went off as well. And the Mercy Sisters elected a sister to go down to the basement and replace the fuse. <laughs> Can you see how the church is blessed by the presence of so many different kinds of consecrated religious, bringing their own blessing and their own particular mission and charism, not only to the place where they minister, but to the whole diocese. In 1997, Pope St. John Paul II instituted a day of prayer for men and women in consecrated life. And this celebration is attached to the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord, February 2nd. This feast is also known as Candle Mass Day, the day on which the candles are blessed, symbolizing Christ who is the light of the world. So too, those in consecrated life are called to reflect the light of Jesus to all peoples. Pope Francis, our first Jesuit Pope, has opened a worldwide year of consecrated life. Beginning last November, until a year from today. In addition to the world's 900,000 vowed sisters, brothers, priests, and consecrated virgins, the year of consecrated life is to include also all oblates of monastic communities members of the Third Orders, associates of religious communities, and members of secular institutes. Most Catholic, most Catholics do not officially belong to any of the groups, but they have benefited from the life and the ministry of vowed religious in schools, parishes, hospitals, evangelization of our country, and countries around the world. Vowed religious 
are also prayerful witnesses of female and male contemplative communities. And in various ways, those in religious life all help Catholic and other Christians live out their baptism. Regarding consecrated life, Pope Francis believes that religious life ought to promote growth in the church by way of attraction. He says, the church must be attractive. Wake up the world. Be witnesses of a different way of doing things, of acting, of living. It is possible to live differently in this world. Religious follow the Lord in a special way, in a prophetic way. Religious should be men and women who are able to wake up the world. The Holy Father expects us, religious, to be real witnesses of a world of doing and acting differently. I believe that we religious must never give up prophesying and never give up challenging the world to embrace the joy of the gospel. There is no doubt that we are living and experiencing some very dramatic events in the life of the church, some of them joyful, some horribly tragic, and some quite unpredictable. But all of them have affected us individually and communally. As we read in the Acts of the Apostles, we are enlightened by the first religious community of the early church. We are challenged by their willingness to be radical in their new life together, taking care of each other, especially those who could not take care of themselves. We are reminded of the generosity of the members of their community and their complete surrender of their material possessions for the greater good and welfare of the community. Each member was to pledge their commitment as disciples of Christ and live and preach and teach the joy of the gospel. Is it a coincidence that we have a Pope by the name of Francis and oddly enough, a Jesuit missionary from South America. He has certainly caught the attention of people from all faith traditions. His personal experience as a religious has caused many of us to question our own living of the evangelical councils. The last pope who belonged to a religious order was Gregory XVI in 1831. As we read in the Acts of the Apostles, the early communities of the church were first founded as an answer to some needs in the church, and they became religious communities in order to foster and give greater stability in their particular ministry. A similar thing is happening today, and we are an example of it. With a renewed awareness of our order's charism, and in response to the gospel mandate to espouse a preferential option for the poor, we are focusing on a specific work of the church to wake up the world 
and to live a way of life needed to support it. In some cases, this implies that we will choose to live in a specific way that will enable us to live closer to the people we serve and make possible deeper relationships among the religious with whom we live. The challenge in adopting to new understandings of religious life and mission as we move forward is to preserve what is essential to community life. Pope Paul VI believed that whatever their size, communities large or small, will not succeed in helping their members unless they are constantly animated by the gospel spirit, nourished by prayer, and distinguished by generous mortification of our old self by the discipline necessary for the forming of our new self and by the fruitfulness of the sacrifice of the cross. Community life, as you and I know, is meant to be a support and a sign of consecrated life. Nonetheless, as we also know, many religious experience the same human difficulties of living together as all other people. <laughs> Community life is a constant challenge. Differences in age, outlook, values, ministry, ecclesiology, and health all contribute to the diversity of members within a community. While this diversity can be a richness of human experience, it can also cause divisions and alienation within the community. Pope Francis was asked, how can religious keep commitments to an apostolate as well as those of community life. How can we combat the tendency toward individualism? How should we act toward sisters and brothers in difficulty or who live or create conflict? How can we combine justice and mercy? in difficult cases. Pope Francis said that community life has an enormous power to call people together. The illnesses of the community, on the other hand, have power that destroys. The temptation against common life is that which is the most disruptive to progress in consecrated life. Sometimes living in community is difficult, but if it is not lived, it is not productive. Work, even that which is apostolic, can become an escape from community <coughs> life. Religious life, with all of its possible diversity is an experience of love that goes beyond conflicts. Community conflicts are inevitable. In a certain sense, they need to happen. If the community is truly to sustain sincere and honest relationships, Conflict is inevitable. That's life. It does not make sense to think of living in a community in which there are sisters or brothers who are not experiencing difficulties in their lives. 
Something is missing from communities where there is no conflict. Conflict, however, must be faced head on. It should not be ignored. Covering it over just creates a pressure cooker that will eventually explode. A life without conflicts is not life. Religious who live together in a spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation, in peace and harmony, give gospel witness to the church and to the world, which is sorely needed. In the early church, Stephen boldly spoke the truth and he suffered martyrdom for it. It was upon his courage and his blood that the church began to grow. It was his martyrdom and thousands that have followed that have continued to wake up the world to the redemptive mission of the church. Many of the martyrs who have died for the faith have been our sisters and brothers, members of our communities, named and unnamed. They have set the bar for those of us who follow after them. Those of us who have benefited from the guidance, instruction, discipline, example, spirituality, tough love, prayer, education, formation, and affection of religious men and women have an opportunity during this year of consecrated life to demonstrate appreciation in some significant way for what they have been given personally and what we have received personally and collectively as a diocese. Some will say about the sisters and brothers and priests, they don't make them like that anymore. And that may be true. But we are the witnesses and the beneficiaries of their commitment and dedication. What can we do? What can we do now in our generation? with the years we have left, with all that lies before us, what can we do to propagate the faith? How can we show our gratitude to those who taught us? How can we pass on what we have learned and experienced from these special servants of God who have come into our life even for a short time. I believe that it can be said that the first religious community to arrive in what is now called the Diocese of Savannah were the Jesuits. Padre Pedro Martinez became the first Georgia martyr killed on Cumberland Island in 1566. The Franciscan friars succeeded the Jesuits. Five Franciscan friars were martyred on September 13, 1597. Thank you to those religious women and men who have shared their vocation of consecrated life throughout the history 
of the Diocese of Savannah. Sisters of Charity of Our Lady of Mercy, Ursuline Sisters, Sisters of Atonement, Sisters of Charity, Sisters of Our Divine Savior, Sisters of St. Joseph, Sisters of St. Joseph of Prandelay, Sisters of St. Mary de Namur, Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, Sisters of the Sacred Heart, the Society of Jesus, Congregation of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for Indians and Colored People, Society of African Missions, Society of Mary, the Sulpicians, the Benedictine Monks, Franciscan Friars Capuchins, Franciscan Friars Minor, Franciscan Friars Conventual, Carmelite Sisters, Christian Brothers, Felician or the Franciscan Sisters, Holy Cross Brothers, Spirit Missionary Sisters, Immaculate Heart of Mary Sisters, Marist Brothers, Missionaries of St. Paul, Missionary Servants of the Most Holy Trinity, Oblate Fathers of Mary Immaculate, Paulist Fathers, Redemptorists, Salvatorians, the Third Order of St. Francis, Trinitarians, Trappists, Vincentians, Sisters of Charity, Order of St. Camillus. Keep them in your prayers this year. Amen.